So this is the first part of the first lecture in a series on Gödel's constructible universe and the consistency of the generalized continuum hypothesis. What we're doing here is extending the course of said theory that we did uh, last year, where we introduced ordinals and cardinal numbers. We talked about questions about the size of power sets and I alluded there to the fact that we don't really know what the size of the power set of just the set of natural numbers is. So this was an old problem whether it went that back to the early days of set theory when Cantor realized that he didn't actually know whether the size of the power set of the natural numbers which he could show was in one-to-one -one correspondence with the real numbers whether it was he knew it was an uncountable infinity, but he didn't know which one. His hypothesis was that it was the very first uncountable infinity. But it wasn't until Gödel in 1939 uh, showed that it was actually consistent with our other uh, hypotheses about sets. So the course will be uh, an extended one in axiomatic set theory. In the first course, we took everything pretty much on an ad hoc basis and just used our intuitions about sets to think about the properties that we wanted to have for them. In this course, we're going to do everything through the medium of formal languages, as you would have had in a logic course. We're going to think about how we're going to express ourselves using a formal language of set theory which is going to have just two symbols, two relations in it, the equality relation and the set membership relation. And we're going to see how, if we think carefully about how we can build up sets in the way that Gödel did, we're going to be able to find a structure in which all of our suppositions, our axioms of sets will be true, but in which it will also be true that the continuum hypothesis holds. There will be extra bonuses because in this universe, the so-called L of Gödel, the axiom of choice is also true. So at the same time he showed that the axiom of choice was also consistent with our other axioms of set theory. So let me review a little bit of how we left things. We thought of ourselves as having a universe V of all sets. So this is the universe of all sets of mathematical discourse. <clears throat> and we built up V in a very simple manner. We started from the empty set and given a level we just took a power set to get to the next level. So each level is the power set of the one before it. So V1 is the power set of the empty set, V2 is the power set of V1, the Vn plus 1 is the power set of Vn. <clears throat> so then when we get to a, a limit ordinal stage, so when we got to V omega, we define that to be the union of the previous levels. And the same thing is true throughout the universe here. If lambda is a limit ordinal, then we take V lambda to be the union of the previous, previous levels. <clears throat> and we ended up here with a structure which set theorists traditionally draw like a cone here, cone of sets. The ordinals running up the middle, a little wonky there, so starting 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then omega perhaps as the first infinite ordinal here. And further omega plus 1, further ordinals and so on, and after a while we reach the first uncountable ordinal, <clears throat> so we shall call that omega 1 here. And in particular, there's going to be an omega 1 plus 1 and so on, and so there's going to be an omega 2 and omega ends in this fashion. 
And after all of the omega n's comes our first limit cardinal. It's the omega th cardinal in this series here. So we think of this V here as built up in this way by this power set operation as containing essentially representatives for all sets of mathematical discourse that we could want. And it's a very economical construction in one sense, right? Because we could just start off with the empty set at the bottom. On the other hand, what is just opaque to us is what this power set operation does. Right? I mean, it's all very well when we think about the finite sets. I know if I've got a set of k objects, the collection of all its subsets has got size 2 to the k. But as soon as I have a collection with omega objects, so for example n, which I treat as being synonymous with omega, this is the set of the natural numbers, this is an infinite set. So the question then arose, what is the power set of omega like here, or the power set of n? How large is this? So this is the question of the continuum. <coughs> so we, we saw that there's a bijection between the power set of omega and all of the functions from omega into 2. I can think of a subset of omega as being given to me by its characteristic function, just a sequence of digits, zeros and ones, that tell me whether k is in there or k plus 1 is not. Thinking of binary representations of real numbers, one can then show fairly reasonably quickly that there is a bijection, a one-to-one -one pairing off, between the real numbers of analysis and the collection of all infinite sequences of zeros and ones. So actually here we've got that this set is bijective with this set. So it has the same cardinality, the same size. And it's not that, I mean, we know exactly where in this hierarchy this power set of omega occurs. Eh? I have that omega is contained in V omega. Right? Every finite natural number is inside this collection of here, the finite sets. So this is going to imply that the power set of omega is going to be contained in the power set of V omega, which of course is just V omega plus 1. So the sets that we're concerned about when we talk about the continuum are just down here at this little point. Right? It's not that they're distributed throughout the universe. What we've got is that this might be a very large set. Right? It may be that the size of this v omega plus 1, it could have size omega 1, or it could have size omega 23, or it could be even something much larger. So this was the conundrum that um, Cantor wrestled with um, throughout the last decades of his life, actually. And he was unable to solve this, this question. <clears throat> and we now know why he was unable to solve it. So Hilbert, in 1902, he, he posed a list of questions for, he thought, new questions for the 20th century in the International Congress of Mathematicians in Paris. And the first problem he put on his list was this continuum problem. Cantor's continuum 
problem. I'll abbreviate <coughs> the question or the ideas around here by CH for continuum hypothesis because Cantor posited that the size, the cardinality of the set of the power set of the natural numbers, this was precisely omega 1. So if we think of the, now I'm drawing the ordinals out sideways, here, here's omega 1, here's omega 2, and so on. What this was saying is if the continuum hypothesis held, right, then this is precisely the place on this line where we've got the cardinality of this, this set. It means, I mean, suppose it had been here, for example. This would mean that there would be, so if the power set of omega was omega 2, this would imply that there'd be a set of numbers, an infinite set of numbers here, which is of intermediate size between n and r. So I can write this here. The cardinality of n, which is just omega, is less than the size of x, and this is less than the size of r, which we're positing in this diagram is just omega 2. <laughs> so we could have uncountable sets of reals which were neither bijective with the natural numbers nor with the reals themselves. Cantor thought this was unlikely. So his hypothesis was that this picture is not correct, the size of the power set of omega is precisely omega 1 here. So the, the continuum problem was to find the truth or falsity of this CH, of the continuum hypothesis. Now, it's more usually written when you find, if you look this up in a textbook or look this up in online, it will be written as something rather like this. Right? Two to the omega, the, the cardinality of a set of functions from omega into 2 is omega 1. Right? In general, there's a generalized continuum hypothesis. That says for any alpha, the size of 2 to the omega alpha is omega alpha plus 1. So again, this is the size of the power set of omega alpha, we've just lifted everything up, and the size of this power set is just the very next available cardinal. Right? So this is the hypothesis here for all alphas. So in 1939, right, Kurt Gödel showed <laughs> that it was consistent with the axioms of set theory the G GCH, the CH, the GCH holds. So part of this course is thinking about what statements like this mean. Right? We introduced in the set theory course, in this kind of, as I said, a heuristic manner, a collection of axioms, which we think are true of all sets. And these are usually called the zamelo frankel axioms. ZF for um, 
So Ernst Zermelo was instrumental in really axiomatizing uh, Cantor's um, implicit ideas about sets. Uh, Frankel gets there because it's reckoned these days that Zermelo missed one of the axioms out, the so-called axiom of replacement. And Frankel, he wasn't the only one, also suggested that um, this axiom should be added to those that Zermelo um, had itemized. So this is Zermelo 1908 here. <clears throat> so we think here of the axioms of set theory. So ZF holds the axioms of ZF holds in our universe of sets. And what uh, Gödel showed, just to give some idea of what we're going to be doing, here's V, and so what Gödel did was to show how to carve out from the middle of V another cone inside here, which is called L. Right. This is a class of constructible sets. So it's a potentially proper, but a subclass of the sets of E. So all of the things in L were in V. He carved out a slice of, he carved out a slice of V here. <coughs> and various things uh, happen that mirror what happens in V. He started out with the empty set down here at the bottom. But and he also showed that in this construction that he gave was it was an accumulating layer right of slices right? at a limit stage he would take unions so the lambda stage of this process will be the union of the previous things yeah. Uh, but of course what I've not specified and what makes this different from the V definition is this transition from here to here. So recall before from V alpha plus one was the power set of V alpha. We threw in all of the subsets of V alpha. So the key idea of his here was to be very parsimonious about which sets were thrown in to go from here to here. He didn't take the whole. He, he didn't. He didn't necessarily take the whole of the power set of L alpha. He only took those that he could define using the logical language of set theory. So L alpha plus one is just those sets definable. from elements of L alpha. So the sets here could be subsets of L alpha, but it wouldn't necessarily be all of them. He'd just take the ones that he could define using a definition in our language. So this restricts the possibly kind of explosive power of taking the whole of the power set. He just took some sets here. And the point of this was that it was such a regular, uniform process that, first of all, it was an orderly process. So this implied actually the axiom of choice would hold because there'd always be a first definition, a second definition, a third definition, right? As one goes through all of the levels. But also this parsimonious choice of sets meant he didn't throw in, for example, too many subsets of omega. He only threw in those that could be defined in this way, in this hierarchical manner. 
So this meant that for Gödel, if this was the omega level and this was the omega first level, he showed that any subset of omega would appear down here before the omega first level. There wouldn't be any more upstairs. And he also showed that each of these levels down here was countable. So actually all we're doing is accumulating countably many sets all the time like this, as we go up. So this is roughly how the argument goes. Right? And what we're going to have to do is make all this into a mathematical argument because there are a number of things that I've just talked about which we haven't kind of mathematized. I've talked about languages, I've talked about defining things. So there is going to have to be a kind of relation between the syntax of language and structures. We need to talk about truth in a structure, which comes back to a logic course. So we need to know about the relation of languages to structure. So we need a semantical definition of truth and satisfaction, which is suitable to our purpose. And we're going to have to have a way of defining this hierarchy of definable sets. And this, this will probably take most, most of the most of the semester to do thoroughly here. So it's quite a slow process and at the beginning there will be quite a lot of emphasis on the syntax, on the logical language in which we're going to do this, in which we're going to formalize our thoughts. And that'll be, part, that'll be for the next part of this lecture. Right, so our first task is actually to look at the formal language in which we're going to speak about sets. And we're going to give this language a mathematical definition so that later on we can actually prove things about the language. So by formalizing it in this way, we can mathematize our syntax, what counts for a well-formed string of sentences or a word of the language, what will count as sentences of the language and what will count as proofs of the language. These will all be able to be susceptible to a mathematical definition. And then we're going to express our axioms that we gave informally before in a rather formal way. So first of all, we just look at, and this is section 1.2 in your notes, we'll look at the formal description of the language itself. So this is given uh, on line 108 in page 4. So let me go, let's run through those constituents there. So the formal language of set theory we're going to have components, we're going to have set variables, and there'll be infinitely many variables. V0, V1 to the n, so on. We're only going to have two predicate symbols, so predicate or relation symbols. And these will be binary. So we're just as for ordinary speak about equality, we'd say that something equals something else, and we're going to have that some x is a member of some a. So these will be two place relations here. We shall have logical connectives of just or and not. But again, you'll remember from a logic course, we can actually define the other connectives from this. So we can define AND, we can define implication, we can define by, impl by implication, just using these as our basic atomic connectives. The reason for keeping this as simple as possible is that when we come to prove things about our definitions, which will be made up of formulae of this form, is that we can then keep the uh, 
recursive definitions of our concept simple, and we can prove by an induction over the complexity of the formula of the language uh, certain properties holding. So the simpler our definition, the more parsimonious our use of connectives, for example, the simpler our recursions are going to be. We take brackets, left and right brackets, to <coughs> uh, punctuate things. And we just take one quantifier, the existential quantifier here. Again, we can define, if you recall, there exists x. If I just say there exists x, it's that not something or other happens. And this is not the case. This is equivalent to saying, for all x, something or other happens about x. So I can define for all in terms of exists. So again, in the spirit of keeping things simple, our formal language, our official definition, will have just these components in. And we'll think of for all as defined in terms of exists using negation. And likewise, we'll think of and as defined in terms of all here. It's not not P or not Q. It's the same as P and Q. So, of course, in, when we write things down, we're going to be rapidly using these things all the time. But our official language will always stick to just this part here. So the formulae are then going to be defined inductively from these components right, in a way that's familiar from a, a, a logic course. I shan't give all the definitions here for this. So so we define inductively what it is for a formula phi <coughs> say to have free variables Find the free variables of phi. I'll just make sure that I have this right. VBL. So these will be the variables that are not bound by quantifiers and for which we can start thinking about substituting objects into those free variables to interpret the formula. So epsilon dot will be interpreted as set membership. And so v0, epsilon dot, v1. This is a symbol string from our formal language using these two free variables and this symbol. At the moment, it's just a syntactic string. If I were to substitute in sets for v0 and v1 and think of this symbol here as denoting set membership, then I can think of this as capable of expressing something like x is a member of y, where I've got sets x and y here. So this is our basic formal language. <clears throat> what we're going to do next is take note of the fact that, um, well, let me first say we can, what we can do from this is straight away say what we mean when sets are equal. If you recall from set theory, one of the first things we defined 
was what it a criterion for when sets are equal. Two sets are equal when they have the same members. So we have then an axiom of extensionality. So this is, you can see, is further down the page on the notes. So this is expressed in terms of all x and for y. If it's the case that for all z, z is a member of x, if and only if z is a member of y, then it's the case that x equals y. This is what it means for two sets to be equal. They simply have the same members. And of course, if they're the same thing, then obviously they will have the same members. So this trivially holds as well. So notice one thing that I've done here. I've gone straight from our formal language. And what have I done? I've already put in this um, equivalence relation here for these for by by implication in a couple of places. I put in a for all instead of not exists not here. And I started taking here, instead of writing variables v0, v1, vk all the time in here, I've decided to again make things a bit quicker by putting in here these x's and y's. These are somehow meta variables that stand in for the variables v0, v1, vk and so on. And I haven't bothered writing dots over the equals and epsilon signs here. And I put in a square bracket here to make the thing more readable. So we immediately become more flexible and avail ourselves of ordinary styles of um, writing out of formulae here. So this is our first axiom, ax0, the zeroth axiom, if you like, the axiom of extensionality. Now we saw that uh, we had to consider proper classes in a set theory course. We denoted the collection of all sets by using what we call an abstraction term or term here. V, the universe of all sets, is the collection of everything, every set that equals itself. Well, that's every set. Set as a collection of all those x's where they do not equal themselves. Since everything equals itself, there are no sets here. This is the empty set. By the axiom of extensionality, there's only one empty set because any two empty sets have the same members vacuously. And we consider the Russell class the collection of x is such that x is not a member of this. And there was Russell's argument that this r here could not be a set itself. If you assume that this was a set, you would get a contradiction. So we call this a proper class. And likewise, v is a proper class. This cannot be a set. So in general, we want to talk about classes as well as sets, and we're going to be we're going to formalize this in a way that's not always done in every course. Right? So we want to be able to say things like set X is a member of a class A. Right? Perhaps being agnostic as to whether A is a set or a proper class. So we want to say things like this. So we're going to introduce into our language terms, class terms. So again, this will be extending our language as we extended it by definition before. We're going to generalize the language a bit. And we're going to allow ourselves syntactic 
strings which will be of this form. Such as a collection of x's such that some formula phi of x. So again here, this is a variable, this is some vk, and in this kind of convention here, I would normally think of, or I'm imagining perhaps, that vk is one of the free variables of phi. There may be other free variables in here as well. So if you look at definition 1.1, which is on page 136, you'll see what we get. So what we're defining are class terms, right? more generally terms, so it's just a string of the form x, so phi of x, here. where x is some vk, and phi is in our language here. So term is either a class term or a variable. It's convenient to include variables as terms. And we use a letter, for example, S or T or R, as the context permits, to denote a term here. So we have variables, which we're familiar with, and then we have these new gadgets. Right? And these are the class terms and the variables are also count as terms. So now we define what the free variables of a term are. So the free variables of the term here well, they will be the free variables of the defining formula in here, with x taken away. So if t is a class term, I now think of this x as somehow being bound here inside this. The x here in this t is no longer free. So it's got one less free variable, if, if x is free in fact. So that's case one, when t is a class term. When it's a variable, then it is its own free variable. Sorry, if t is a variable. X, say, then the free variables of t, and this is just the free variables of x, is just x. It's kind of an easy trivial case. Okay. So this defines what it is to, what it means to be a term. It piggybacks upon the definition of what a formula is. So now we've actually defined what um, terms are going to be in a language. 
let's just have a look and see how they work. So if you look here at your notes, which I'm going to put up here on page five, in the middle of page five, we'll see how um, terms will work in practice. So there, uh, at the top of definition one, one is what I just did on the board a moment ago here. So I want to emphasize that being a term is a term such as we have here, right? a class term isn't a part of our official language. The idea is that we could always eliminate it and make our language strip it back to its uh, proper initial settings, as it were. So it's really just an abbreviation. So if this is a term T, I'm going to write something like this. This is phi but I've actually substituted the term in for the variable x. That's what this notation means here, into phi. So now I've got a formula phi, which is about this term. Now, I want to make sure that I can make sense of this. <laughs> I say that you know, we can think of a term as not being part of our language. Well, this would also not be part of our official language. We want to be flexible and write things like this. So the following recursion on the next lines here says how you can actually eliminate these terms and get the language back to basics. So it's a recursion with these one, two, three, four, five clauses in. And the idea is that the thing on the left can be replaced by the thing on the right. So in my generalized language, if I've got y as a member of this class term here, so this statement actually is just the same as saying that phi holds of y. After all, this is the class of x's such that phi x holds. So if y is in here, I can say that phi holds of y, and I've replaced it with, replaced it, replaced x by y in the formula. The next clause says two class terms are equal, just like for sets, when they have the, they're true about the same things. So this is for all y. If phi holds of y, substituted for x, if and only if psi holds for y, substituted of x. So this will then mean these two class terms have the same set, same sets, we say in their extension. The third one is I say that the set Z is this class term here. Well, what does equality mean? It means that anything that's in this side is in this side and vice versa. And that's precisely what I've written here for all Y. Y is in Z if and only if Y is in the class term here. But you might object. You said you were going to eliminate class terms on the left and replace them with things in the official language on the right. Well, of course, I've still got these for alls here, but here I've, you could object, I've still left this class term here. But this I can make sense of recursively by going back to line one. And likewise down here, to say that this term is a member of this term, right? is to say precisely there is a set y which is this and psi holds of y. So note one thing in particular, this is going to mean that I'm only going to talk about one term being a member of another term if I know that it's a set. So I'm ruling out here by this line that proper classes can be members of proper classes or sets. Right? Something to be on the left of the membership sign is to mean that it's a, a set. So here I've made this assertion. There is a set Y, which is this class term, and Psi holds of this Y. And finally, this term is to be a member of this set. Again, this means there is a set Y, which is in Z, and y equals the term we're discussing. 
And again, I can make sense of this because I already recursively define what it means for a set to be a term here up on line three. So this, this gives us a precise recursive way of translating a generalized formula which involves terms, expressions like this into term-free expressions if I wanted to. There are many ways that we can use terms. I mean, here's just a simple example. I can think of X as being the class of Y's such that Y is a member of X. Because by extensionality, this equals this if and only if they have the same members. And so of course they do. So we've got actually here a very flexible arrangement. Right? So though this may, idea of a term may look a little bit strange at the beginning, it's actually very flexible and very useful, especially when, it, again, it comes to de defining recursions on, on formulae. So we've already said that we've got some terms. So let's look at some more terms down here in 1.2. V I already had up on the board. It's the class of X's which equal themselves. There's the empty set again. And now I introduce the subset relation as a defined relation, a binary relation between, and I'm going to use letters like R, S, and T for terms, right, here. I'll say that this term is a subclass of this one, if and only if every set that's in X is in T. And of course, if S and T are terms that are sets that we're used to thinking about, of course, this is just a subset relation. S union T, so this is the collection of objects that are in either the term S or in T. So I'll define that, this expression, to be this one here. So I'm defining expressions in terms of generalized formulae, which can involve terms. Here is the intersection, obviously the things that are in both. The complement of this term S is all of the things that are not in S. In general, this will be a proper class of things. S less T or S minus T, the class of things that are in S but not T. And so this continues. The union of a, a class S, just as the union of a set, is the collection of those X's such that there is a set in S where X is in it. So X is a member of some Y that's in S. Here is an unordered entuple, we would say. So this is a collection of five terms here, T1 to Tn. And actually this is a collection of X's So that and that sets X as X equals T1 or T2 or Tn. So again, in this expression, I've only got sets inside these bra curly brackets here. I'm not allowed to put anything that could be a proper class inside curly brackets, to make it a set. Here's the definition of ordered pair. Here's the definition of ordered entuple, defined again recursively. If I've got ordered pairs defined, the ordered triple x1, x2, x3 is the collection of ordered pairs where the second thing is x3 and the first thing is the ordered pair x1, x2. We defined again in set theory the Cartesian product of sets, now I've written X and Z. It's the collection of U pair ordered pairs UV, where U is in X and V is in Z. Indeed, I could have extended this and I'm wondering for a moment why I did. I could have taken here terms rather than sets, R and S, for example. And in fact, here you can see on the next line I've taken, I'm gonna say that T squared is actually T cross T where T is a, a term. And here's the Cartesian product of T with itself N plus one times 
it's a Cartesian product of itself, n times one more time. Yeah. So next time we will go back and discuss there the rest of the axioms there. Okay, thank you.